With a hooey, oh hit in a loo. With a hooey, oh hit in a loo. Breakfast with Bob and John. <laughs> Pacho Man! Round of applause for our man, Pacho Man. We are presented by EA Sports Nutrition, Cliff Bar, Timex, Roca, Tanya Puta Resort, Rudy Project, Slow Twitch, Jan Ferdano. It seems like it was just a year ago. Was he saying nice things about me? In that he, was, he was saying, he was saying, Jan and Sebi, Sebi and Jan. I'm not sure I'm picking yet, but I've got a Jan card right here. Jan for Dano card. Yeah, baby. It's one up on me. You don't have one, do you? Nope, haven't got one. Sorry. I haven't even seen them. Look at that, huh? Jeez. Pretty sweet. You on the yeah. bike. Oh. So, 2008 Olympic gold. Now Ironman 70.3 gold. Now we got one more. We got Ironman... Hawaii gold. That would be pretty sweet. It would be pretty sweet. I mean, I've been Nobody's working. done that. Triple crown. Your own triple crown. Yeah, I sort of um, read, uh, read, a, read a cheeky tweet that it's widely accepted that McKinley Jones has achieved this. but <laughs> No, she was silver. <laughs> yeah, I know she was, but yeah, that was yeah. just a bit of a side sidekick. Yeah. But um, <laughs> um, obviously, yeah, been working really hard and, and um, yeah, pushing really hard for this goal. Yes. It's uh, at the forefront of our mind, has been all season. This is the one it's been uh, shaping up for, the one that I've, that I've worked all season right. for. And um, just hope I can put the goods together on Saturday. What was the toughest transition going from that Olympic format, Olympic, Olympic distance, to... It's, it's like when somebody goes from the 1500, they jump up to a 5K. It's, it's long, obviously a long, it's more than double the distance, but... You're talking going from under two hours to, you know, just like under four hours. That, that's a, long, that's a long, uh, long way to go for somebody who's an Olympic distance guy. Yeah, but you know what? The physical fitness is, is one thing. You know, yeah. before the Olympic distance guys, they, they train a lot and they right. train hard. And, really hard. And I was probably always, you know, at, at the upper end of what people were training then. You know, training between 40 and 45 hours. I don't right. train anymore. Actually, I train less now in terms of hours. And um, so the physical fitness is there, but right. the mental longevity of it. And I don't mean like in terms of years. I mean during a race, the ups and downs you deal with. If you have a down in an ITU race, you're done. You're done, right? That's it. Out. See you later. Parking my bike. I'm going back to the hotel or whatever. It's, um, you're nowhere in the mix. Whereas here, you are in it. In fact, there is no way you're not going to have a, a bad moment in those eight hours. It it's, happens to everybody, happens to, to the pros, happens to the age groupers out there. And it's normal. And what was probably the hardest thing for me is, is dealing with it. You know? Right, because you're not used and, to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you, were, if you were a little injured or something, you either didn't start or knew quickly and you're out of the race. Pretty much, you know. And yeah. you, you race so many times that it doesn't really matter. Whereas now you've got two big races in the year. 70.3 Worlds, Kona Worlds. Well, for me, it was Frankfurt and, and, Frankfurt, and, yes. and, Kona, and, yes. and Kona Worlds. And, so uh, Frankfurt was more important than 70.3 Worlds for you? Yeah, much more important. Because it's, of uh, because home Germany? race. And yeah. let's be honest, you know, as, as great as 70.3 is. It's brand we, new. It's brand new. And, and Iron Man is really where it's at. You know, it's the appreciation, the reception amongst people and and also for myself you know they didn't call it middle distance for no reason earlier that's why they changed it to 70.3 because it was sort of like a half thing you know they, it's they not, weren't quite sure it wasn't quite doing yeah. the big one and, it's not know. quite olympics and that's exactly what it is there's two big races in triathlon it's kona and it's the olympics right and everything in between is you know it's great that we have it and we have great locations and we have so many great venues to go to but in terms of the big stage, those are the two big ones, right? right? So in order to prepare for something like Hawaii, you obviously, or I decided to prepare for Frankfurt because it's, it's, it's a full distance race, right. you know? And it's so different. The 70.3 distance is so much closer to Olympic distance. It really is. It, it sounds like it's sort of halfway, but no. the speed you're running at, even the swim, the whole tactics, it's so much more aggressive. And, you know, with the kind of fitness, you, you don't really blow up in a 70.3. And you can't, you can't really recover. And if you do blow up, you're done yeah, in a 70.3. pretty much. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's that much quicker. Whereas, you know, here, the whole, yeah, endurance aspect, the whole mental, the whole preparation. I mean, you go into it, 70.3, you've got a couple of gels in your bottle, two bottles on your bike, if that. 
and off you go. Right. You come to an Ironman, I'm <laughs> counting like 25 gels and salt tablets and this. <laughs> uh, separate. It's a lot uh, more preparation, right? I've got a separate suitcase. I feel like a baby. Like I've got all this extra food coming in, <laughs> liquid gels and all that business. And it's, that, that's why I chose an Ironman, to prepare for an Ironman. It's an eating and drinking contest. There's a lot more to that. I've, I've heard about that. Day. Yeah, Sebi. Sebi is uh, one of Sebi's favorite quotes, I guess. And yes. Yeah, Got to have a, an iron stomach to go with all of that. Yeah. So speaking of Sebi, what I, when you look back at our history with rivalries with a Norman Stadler and a Chris McCormick and a Mark Allen and Dave Scott and Paul Nevy Frazier and Aaron Baker, right now we have something similar you know, in the brewing stage between you and Sebastian Keenley. I mean, last year he won Frankfurt and he won here. This year, you won Frankfurt, and hopefully, and you won 70.3. So it's, it's like sort of two to two when, when you look at it. Yeah, not really. Not if you win Kona, that's like one above everything, it's, at it's least true. one above. Exactly. <laughs> but talk a little bit about how that, the rivalry, a fellow German, you're on the same team, but that's a guy you've got to beat to, to win this race. Yeah, absolutely, and it's, um, it's good to know that there's someone there who's not backing off. Right. There is, there is always something ch someone chasing, and you cannot let your guard down until the finish line. Right. And it's, it's really, you know, what dreams are made of in terms of sport. You want to have someone like that that just pushes you to new boundaries, that pushes you to new levels, uh, as cheesy as that sounds. But that's yes. really the way it is. You know, if I'm suffering, I'm thinking... Well, he's probably suffering at least just you as think? much. Yeah. So, you know, just keep pushing, keep going. And, um, yeah, I guess as much as he thinks of destroying me on the bike, I think of just running past him as though he's standing still. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about what you learned from your first experience last year. Because you had, you had a flat, then you had a penalty, uh, then you, I think you ran in the transition between bike and run, realized you had the wrong outfit on, ran back in, changed... So you had a lot of little rookie things going on. What did you take away from last year's Kona? In short, the thing I, that, that helped me the most is that I learned never to give up, no matter how hopeless the situation may seem. Yes. And that's the thing coming from ITU. If you are in 19th place, 20 minutes down, <laughs> go home. Just don't, like seriously, sa save your legs. Go and have a hard training session tomorrow. Right. And um, dealing with that and dealing with the adversity of having a call made against you that you don't really agree with, right. in fact, not at all, it's kind of like, okay, I have to beat you, the referee, and the course, and the conditions, and myself at times. It's and figure out when to take a gel and all that crap. Yeah, and all that, you know, just sort of like, I was sitting there for two hours feeling sorry for myself, and I'm like, it's not the way to do it. No. And that's what I learned from that race that just mentally toughened me up quite a bit more. Yes. You know, I, I, yeah, I think that's, that's something that you need in Hawaii is the fact that giving up unless you feel like your calf is tearing off or it is tearing off um, is not an option. It's interesting. We were interviewing Mark Allen yesterday and he was talking about you know, being you know, 12, 13 minutes down in his last race here. And you know, the mentally you're saying to yourself, my condo's right there. This is silly. I don't need this. And then he finally just said to himself, shut up. <laughs> right? Just one foot in front of the other. Don't, don't think. Quit thinking and everything turned out great. Did you find yourself telling yourself last, last year, okay, just shut up and race? Yeah, well, you know, I ran past the house we were staying at twice. And <laughs> at the very latest, when they forget to pull the, put that Coke or whatever they're handing you yes. on ice and you get a warm drink oh. and you're just like, man, seriously, seriously, why? Just, just <laughs> why am I doing this? It was cold. There's a fridge of cold beers right where I need it. You know, I don't feel like any more of the sweet stuff anyways. But that's the spirit of Ironman. It's, um, there is yeah. no giving up. That's it. You can't go and race next week. There's no this or that. It's, it's somehow owed to the tradition of the race as well. Right. I mean, that sounds a bit... Not at all. Yeah, no, no. There's a, there's a vibe here. Exactly. It's, it's something special. And, and the uniqueness of this race is made up because, you know, so many of these breakdowns and revivals happen in one day and if you want to be a part of that you best keep going until the finish line what was the feeling like uh it, it, coming down a lead drive first time you've done it i know it's third place and you won the win but just the, the did you take in that moment uh, it, here's a guy who's an olympic gold medalist you're not winning the race but that it still was it still meaningful for you 
Um, coming down at Lihi was probably as terrible as for most of us. Um, it just it just hurts at yeah. that point. You know, it's yeah. Ironman is a thing. You can't go any slower. It doesn't feel better. <laughs> you go faster. It doesn't feel better either. You know, you actually have to stop in order to start recovering. <laughs> But once I did stop, I must admit, it was a, a pretty special feeling. That finish line, you know, is something that I've um, looked at for quite some time now. And, you know, when you see the guys who have won along the side, um, of course, that's something to, to strive towards. But it was a rare moment where I was well and truly happy with a third place just because it's, you know, I felt like it was an ach yeah. achievement um, mentally as well as physically dealing with the adversity coming through and then being rewarded with a podium um, was one of the moments where I could actually say I was really happy with the third place. When you look back at your Olympic gold, right, and I'm, we were chatting not that long ago on the radio show, and you, you reminded me that going into that race, I think it was Daniel Unger had won 2007 IT Worlds and hadn't lost since. Yeah. And Javier Gomez was the odds-on favorite to win the gold medal. They were setting up a party for him back in Spain beforehand. And people weren't really talking Jan Ferdano, but every run you did that year leading in, you, last couple hundred yards, you sprinted every run at the end of every run because you knew the medal was going to come, gold was going to come down to that. Do you flash back on that sometimes and, and just remember how special that was to win that gold medal? I, I flash back to the preparation of it for sure, you know, um, going through how meticulously we were prepared and moving out of home, moving into the training center, even though it was just a couple of K up the road, but it was just kind of a focus thing. Yeah. And it reminded me what it's like to have a big time goal. And um, I haven't, haven't had that f for quite some time yeah. until I transitioned to the long distance to, right. to you know, Ironman racing. And uh, it reminded me that having a big time goal is what it's all about. The sport really only makes sense. Yes. When you got that big time goal, because otherwise you're just sort of floating along, coming da da da. Race to race to race, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's something that I'm really grateful for that I found that second burst for a second career almost. It really know? is, yeah. And um, the magic of this island sort of gave it to me. Frankfurt, uh, did you uh, like lose your your power meter or your your Garmin, and really were you sort of racing by feel rather than by numbers? Yeah, I lost just about everything. Um, <laughs> Except my shit in that race, excuse me. Can I say that on TV? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Did you really? Um, yeah, I lost my power meter. I lost my the whole Garmin thing. I lost my nutrition bottle, which yes. the power meter was attached to. I lost my... I didn't actually lose my gel bottle, so I guess that was one thing. But it was well, quite pop unique. Pop off your bike? Yeah. That's... <laughs> That's the one thing. Um, it sounds super cool and super awesome to be the first guy to ride stuff, but being on prototypes, you know, it's... You yeah, know, prototypes it, on a race day, yeah, that's an important race. It's, um, we make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone out there. So um, it's not always quite as cool as it sounds. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've definitely done our best to, um, yeah, to, to iron out all those things. But for me, it was the situation of dealing... With adversity, I guess, again. Yes. Making a plan and, and realizing that whatever you plan for doesn't really matter. You just have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to, yeah, um, keep it together. And, you know, in Ironman, there's so many aid stations. You go right. there and every few Ks, you go and whatever grab I want. a drink. It was just interesting because it's a two-lap course. So all of a sudden, there's 20 age groupers going for the same bottle of whatever it was yes. at the same time as you yeah, cutting through a few probably um, illegal or slightly on the border of illegal moves cutting through yes. just grabbing their bottle and trying to lose not too much time Right. and that was my biggest concern is you've got to slow down you've got to get a bottle and, and, and drink it all at once to throw it away to then ride to the next aid station so in terms of hydration plans it probably wasn't ideal not what everybody would suggest but it worked out and it's good that way did you change much from last year's race here to this year's race in terms of training preparation equipment um well equipment huge you know i've changed the the biggest part of changed bike sponsors and um worked with the guys at canyon to get a bike that really fits me perfectly yes. i think um i think it's shown in my bike performance over, yeah. uh, over the 408 season. or something you ran at the 404 yeah 408 in, uh, yeah, yeah, in frankfurt, in frankfurt. Yeah. i mean that was the first time i've ever ridden 180 in one go but nonetheless it's um it's um, yeah. It's been really good. It's been 
really calming for me to get that out of the way. Like yes. it, the equipment is dialed. You know, last year, I can say it now, but I mean, the night before the race, I went and looked for some lubricant that I thought was, would give me an extra watt of a faster <laughs> chain. And I mean, I mean, is there anything more stupid? Is there anything less professional for a professional to do? But there I was, and you know, Conrad Stoltz actually helped me out, yeah. and we had a chat and, and all that, and I'm sure he's still laughing at the, at the situation now. Here's this rookie guy, yeah. I have no clue what he's doing. Pretty much, but um, yeah, those are the parts of the process that you go through, and uh, I guess it's, it's nice to have a rookie moment like that every now and then, to just realize you're still human and you know, still make a plan, and it's, it's not that far from what everybody else is doing. So your, your wife, Emma Snowsill, just was inducted in ITU Hall of Fame. Did you, uh, you guys both won gold medals in 2008 in Beijing. Did you know each other before that or did you connect after both winning Olympic golds? Well, we knew each other off the scene, obviously. Right. You know, it's been, um, it's, yeah, you know, you race together, yeah. see each other around the world, but it was only quite a bit afterwards that we actually, you know, got to meet and hang out and have a coffee, get married. <laughs> <laughs> she was doing some commentating for us last year. And she was watching you and doing, you know, standing on the side of the road, getting your penalty, and she's like shaking her head, going, "Oh my God!" And we were asking, "So, how's Jan been this week?" And she's like, "No comment." Yeah. <laughs> How hard is that? As a, you've got a your spouse who obviously understands racing and obviously understands what it takes, and just trying to, you know, to to be still be a good husband and and but you're a professional athlete at the same time, keeping your cool and keeping everything together. Yeah, I didn't do so well at that last year. I was, I'm sure I was a bit of a pain about to deal with. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think this year we've we've figured things out and it's come a little bit smoother. Um, just with the whole thing about being more relaxed. And I've realized I race the best when I'm relaxed. It's right. um, got to be chilled out and having a good laugh with a few buddies, you know, the it's night the before. It's, it's, it's fantastic because in the end, you know, yeah, you've got to seriously prepare. You've got to be professional about things, but eventually you just have to relax and let it go and that's something I've struggled with for a long time I am German after all yeah, exactly and um, um, yeah just getting a bit of keeping my cool it's just been yeah the secret to success what would it mean to you you've got the Olympic gold you got the 70.3 gold to get this gold because this is this is I think a lot of people do look at this as as an Olympic gold that Ironman has been around since 78 and to win this race and go into history books is, uh, is pretty special well, you know what? It, it's it's the Wimbledon of our sport. Let's be honest. You know, yes. this is like what what Wimbledon is to tennis. That's what this is to our sport. No it question. is the biggest, coolest triathlon-specific race. The Olympics is the biggest thing in sports in general right. to me. But yeah, um, I'm I've got my sights set high. I've trained for this moment, and as much as I'm not worried with the outcome right now, I'm just focusing on each and every step to get there, and that's about all I can do right now. So Love I'll it. take it from there. Jan, thanks so much for taking time out. A round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Jan Ferdano, Pancho Man, come on back in. Again, we're presented by ES Sports Nutrition, Cliff Bar, Timex, Roca, Tanya Putta Resort, Rudy Project, Slow Twitch, and Pancho Man. With a hooey, oh, hit and a With a hooey, oh, hit and a And breakfast with Bob. Aloha, Tuesday morning. Yeah, thank you, Pancho Man.